Again, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to talk here about the Neisseria genus, and this is not one particular organism. There are two that you need to be familiar with for exam purposes, but I want to go over briefly the genus because the two species, Neisseria gonorrhea and Neisseria meningitidis, have a lot in common. Uh, so if we start with that, and you know this, then you'll be good to go for the two species. You'll just need to remember uh, a couple distinguishing factors that will be important on the exam. So let's get into it. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. I've got the link below in the description of the video, or you can click on the button on the upper right hand corner up here. If you can consider chipping in a dollar a month, a little bit goes a long way to help keep these videos free. I really appreciate any contributions I can get. All right, so. I did a general overview of gram-negative bacteria, uh, so I'm not going to go into this uh, in, in specifics, but you do need to be aware for step one of the differences between the gram-positive cell wall and the gram-negative cell wall. This will be important, and I go into this in detail in the overview video. This is how you do a gram stain. You'll want to be familiar with uh, how this works and why it works the way it does. Now, remember that when you look on uh, in the microscope at a gram-negative bacteria, it's going to appear reddish-pink, whereas the gram-positives will appear purple. We're going to talk about the classification of Neisseria. We'll talk about the general characteristics that they have in common, and then we'll talk about uh, some of the diseases, but I'm not going to go into detail. I just want to give you sort of a, a 30,000 foot overview of the diseases that are going to be coming up when we talk about each of the species in detail individually. This is our algorithm. You'll want to memorize this for the exam. We're right here in the gram-negative diplococci. As you can see, there are three of them. I'm going to do videos on Neisseria meningitidis and Neisseria gonorrhea. I may or may not do a video on Moraxella cateralis. It's very low yield for the exam. Uh, so, uh, look for these coming soon. Okay, so the Neisseria species, uh, they have in common that they are gram-negative diplococci. What does that mean? It means that there are two round organisms that are basically attached to one another. Alright, so you can see here, this is, uh, I believe, Neisseria uh, meningitidis here. And you can see that you have these little pairs of pinkish organisms. And oftentimes you're going to find these inside cells, okay? inside cells. Now, you don't need to distinguish on the microscope Neisseria meningitidis versus Neisseria gonorrhea because the disease processes are completely different. So you'll be given a vignette and, and it'll be abundantly clear whether you're dealing with Neisseria meningitidis or Neisseria gonorrhea. But you need to know these other characteristics. First, all Neisseria are oxidase positive. Oxidase positive. So you want to put that in your back pocket and know uh, your oxidase positive organisms because there's a particular disease, you may be aware of it, that puts you at risk for oxidase positive disorders. Next, uh, Neisseria is aerobic. It is aerobic. It is usually intracellular, um, but there are various species that are facultative intracellular. Some of them are obligate intracellular. This is important here. Neisseria species grow on something called Thayer Martin auger. It is selective for Neisseria. So what a selective auger plate is, is it's an auger plate that's enriched with nutrients and then uh, enriched, so to speak, uh, with antibiotics. Now the nutrients will help it grow and the antibiotics will prevent other things from growing. So the Thayer Martin auger has vancomycin, which inhibits gram-positive growth. It's got trimethoprim and colistin, which inhibits other gram-negatives besides Neisseria. And then it's got Nystatin, which inhibits fungus. So with those antibiotics, it will select for Neisseria. 
So you need to know Thayer, Martin, Augur for Nyceria. Some characteristics. Three things that both of the Nyceria species have in common. One, an IgA protease. Now that is useful for the bacteria to be able to grow on mucosal surfaces. So what do we think of when we think of Nyceria gonorrhea? We think of the, uh, the reproductive tract, we think of the urethra, and what do we think of when we think of Nyceria meningitis? We think of the oropharynx, the nasopharynx, uh, the meninges, and so it grows on mucosal surfaces. Remember that IgA is the antibody that helps uh, kill bacteria that are growing on mucosal surfaces, and it's a dimer. So what happens is that this IgA protease will cleave the IgA molecule and uh, prevent it from, from killing the organism or from, from directing the immune system from killing the organism. So IgA protease are common to both Neisseria species. Next, there's the lipooligosaccharide. This is an endotoxin. It's, it's inherent to the organism and it is immunogenic. It can cause septic shock uh, through the immune system responding to that and releasing TNF and IL-1, which uh, results in a fulminant immune response. It's got adhesins, so this again helps it grow on mucosal surfaces. Uh, there are pili and fimbriae, they have antigenic variation, so that makes it difficult to develop, well you can develop an immune response, but because of the variation, uh, you're, you're not going to be able to kill off future infections. So uh, it, it's, it, it's very difficult to develop immunity to Neisseria gonorrhea in general, for instance. Some specific characteristics, I'll go into these in the next videos, but Neisseria gonorrhea ferments glucose only, whereas Neisseria meningitis ferments both maltose and glucose. The way to remember this, gonorrhea starts with a G and it's glucose only, whereas meningitis starts with an M and that can ferment maltose too. Also, Neisseria meningitis has a polysaccharide capsule. Neisseria gonorrhea is not encapsulated. That polysaccharide capsule is going to be very important when we talk about vaccination. These are the diseases caused by the Neisseria species. So you can see with Neisseria gonorrhea, you've got a lot of venereal diseases. Gonorrhea is the most common. That can lead to pelvic inflammatory disease, and that can lead to Fitzhugh Curtis syndrome. Uh, gonorrhea can also cause septic arthritis if the Neisseria gets into the bloodstream and seeds the joints. And then there's gonococcal neonatal conjunctivitis, which is congenital and due to neonatal exposure in the vaginal tract, which results in a separative conjunctivitis. Neisseria meningitidis, well, it's in the name meningitidis, meningitis. So you got meningococcal meningitis, which is a very, very, very problematic a disease amongst younger people living in close quarters. You can also get meningococcemia if it gets into the bloodstream, which can lead to sepsis. And then a very common disease that comes up on your steps because it integrates endocrinology and pathology. It's Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome, which is an adrenal hemorrhage. Uh, and this, again, comes up a lot on your exam. Worth pointing out that there are higher rates of infection in the terminal complement deficiencies. Remember C5 through C9 are important for uh, forming that membrane attack complex, which is a really good way of killing Neisseria species. So if you have a deficiency of C5 through C9, you're gonna have an increased risk for Neisseria. Another one is the C5 inhibitor. There is a, a, a medication that's given for paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria to prevent the formation of the membrane attack complex and thus prevent lysis of red blood cells. That medication inhibits C5. So if you're giving that medication, you've got a much, much higher risk, thousands fold, of developing a Neisseria infection. And we'll talk about that when we get to the Neisseria meningitis video.